The deanery at Sonning on Thames is a particularly fine example of Lutyen's early Romantic style. It was built in 1889 for Edward Hudson, managing director of Country Life, the magazine he had founded two years earlier, and which from the first contained an illustrated article on a country house as a central feature. Sonning is an ideal location for a Lutyen's house and the deanery shows how well he was able to harmonise with the general environment. One of Lutyen's greatest attributes as an architect was his ability to take advantage of the opportunities suggested by a particular situation. In this case, the site was surrounded by an ancient wall, and it was this wall, so much a part of the village structure, which suggested to him the game of surprise and illusion at which he was an expert. In his formative years, Lutyens had been greatly influenced by the philosophy of the arts and crafts movement. Its principles of design were taken from the traditional buildings that were so familiar in the part of West Surrey where he spent his boyhood. What particularly interested him was the way the compositions related to their settings, something he first noticed in the drawings of Randolph Caldicott, a book illustrator who drew gabled cottages and picturesque farmhouses in an enchanting way. The vernacular buildings of Surrey, Sussex and Hampshire were Lutyen's first inspiration. We can see some of these qualities in the High Street at Sonning, with its human scale and rich variety of shapes and textures. The three gable ends form a striking rhythm in contrast to the white painted brickwork. Strips of windows nestle under the eaves in a framework of timber beams. With the simplest elements, brick, timber and tiles, the village builder has produced a practical and harmonious solution. Lutyen's knowledge of these buildings was coupled with his understanding of the qualities of the work of Philip Webb. This is the Red House at Bexley Heath. Two things impressed him about Webb's buildings, their integrity and the way Webb managed to create an element of surprise so that on walking round his buildings there are a series of interesting incidents. Simple materials, sound craftsmanship, moral rightness, harmony with the landscape, and a deep insight into the principles underlying vernacular architecture. These were the essential ingredients of Lutyen's philosophy. Although many of his buildings are sensuous and romantic, his work has an underlying discipline which eventually led him towards classicism. On first seeing the deanery, I was fascinated by this complex and picturesque roofscape. This part of the house is an extension added later by assistants. Lutyens didn't supervise it and didn't altogether approve, but I think it makes an important contribution, particularly when seen from the road. So far, we know very little about this house. The roofs are intriguing but uninformative, and I think this must have been Lutyens' intention. The front door has a rather medieval quality. Originally, it allowed a glimpse inside, a favorite device of many architects and one often used by Lutyens. Immediately on entering, Lutyens secures his first tour de force, a vaulted entrance. Already we're captured and must respond to Lutyens intention that we come in. The vaulting of tile and chalk suggests a cloister and we're immediately bombarded with associations, ecclesiastical or academic. There's a Romanesque strength and an almost oriental delight in pattern. The effect is serene, 
the scale is intimate and there's an atmosphere of protection and reassurance. If the vaulting is rather formal and academic, the view of the house seen in the court is informal and domestic. This is a typical medieval device, a slight overhang with a powerful rhythm of oak beams and a continuous band of windows immediately below the roof. But what's so captivating about this court is Lutchin's skillful handling of the scale and of the modelling of all these shapes. The rhythmic pattern of the windows and the beams below them give the sort of richness we've seen in vernacular work. But there are surprises like the patterned panel of chalk blocks near the door. The sculptural quality is superb and these are not just attractive shapes but shapes charged with meaning because the visual richness is domestic. And what of the paving and the fountain? Well, this is formal again, an extension of the academicism of the vaulting. The two lock together rather well. So a good deal happens to us when we walk into this Lutchen's architectural theatre. The vaulting continues because we are moving along the same important circulation axis. With the staircase, another powerful visual punctuation, Lutchens returns to the strength idea, with oak beams and elaborately carved newel posts. Then on down the passage where the chalk roof vaults change to oak beams, which is Lutchens' sign that we've moved into the living quarters. A glimpse into the living room. And beyond the door, more striking because Lutyens has deliberately prevented our seeing it until now, is the garden. It was designed by Gertrude Jekyll who has been described as probably the greatest artist in garden design that England has ever produced. And the subtle relationship between house and garden is a feature of all the houses on which Lutyens and Miss Jekyll collaborated. In looking at Lutyens' work, two questions spring immediately to mind. First, whether we can take seriously the work of someone who was using a medieval architectural language at a time when a new approach to design was evolving. And secondly, if we accept his technique, how good was he as an architect? First, let us consider the major criticism that has been levelled against Lutyens. I think this is usually directed against his failure to take account of the ideological discussion about the future of architecture that was taking place in Europe and America at the beginning of this century. Lutyens was never involved in the soul-searching that produced modern architecture and was not interested in the possibilities suggested by the new materials, steel and concrete. But when he began to practice as an architect in 1889, at the age of 20, the modern movement had not begun, and during the next two decades there were only the first stirrings of a new approach to design. Only Macintosh in these islands was really making any headway towards a new kind of expression. This is his Glasgow School of Art, a building whose clean lines and abstract window pattern embodies the spirit of modern architecture. But this was built in 1909, 20 years after Lutyens began his practice. And this was at a time when the English educational establishment was so wedded to classicism that they founded the British School at Rome, designed by Lutyens in 1910.
Even here, in a classical stronghold, Lutyens has managed to suggest an English manorial flavour with his use of timber beams and furniture. The vernacular influence here is similar to that of the deanery, but in each case there's a powerful underlying discipline. The arrangement of house and garden appears informal, but Lutyens has planned them strictly in accordance with a series of axes. From the entrance at the street, the main communication axis starts and runs through the house along the main passageway into the formal garden ending at the steps which radiate outwards towards the wild part of the garden. A second axis links the fountain in the courtyard with the part of the garden to the side of the house. A third joins the fountain, the fireplace in the living room and the large bay window on the garden front. The living room is the same width as the courtyard. A water channel in the garden runs parallel with the garden front of the house. Where this meets the main circulation axis, there's an incision under the bridge. And here, at this focal point, Lutyens has placed a circular pool. Then this axis runs on until it meets another path at right angles that connects it, in turn, with the axis from the fountain in the courtyard to the side garden. This means that the garden is divided so that the formal area is near the house and the wild part beyond. Lutyen's game of surprise is not yet finished. The living room, as the final part of the internal movement sequence, is a magnificent space, with a sense of grandeur due to its height. This is in striking contrast to the low-ceilinged corridor which leads to it. Once again, the theme is a structural one. The oak roof truss and beams form a pattern which breaks up the wall surface and also gives the room a human scale. But this is not simply decoration. It tells us how this part of the building is constructed. The oak panelling at the lower level increases the sense of intimacy and forms a framework for the windows and doors leading back to the entrance corridor. The fireplace is the symbolic heart of the house and Lutyens characteristically forms a pattern with tiles to capture our attention. Again, there's strength and simplicity with the sculptural handling of the forms. This is a door set deeply back alongside the fireplace and each echoes the other. The lower part of the room has a succession of rich visual incidents of this sort. But the psychology is equally important. To Lutyens, home was first and foremost a refuge, which must have a sense of enclosure, a sense of security, and a feeling of strength. We're left in no doubt of this by the way he uses the materials. From the vaulted entrance corridor, the staircase is framed by a structure of oak beams which support the floor above.
going up the stairs, the carving on the ends of these beams and their spacing is agreeably intricate. As we walk up, the roof trusses and the beams in the wall point to the left, towards something we can't yet see. And then, suddenly, through the banisters is the gallery. The gallery is an example of how Lutyens could take a medieval device and use it with an authority that was based on an understanding of traditional craftsmanship. There's something very reassuring about these massive oak beams, and Lutyen's arrangement of them brings down the scale and also breaks up the space in an interesting way, so that instead of being merely a corridor, it has a positive character of its own. The side of the house is modest and homely, but when we look at it, it's full of charm and interesting detail. The rainwater pipes and gutters are made of oak. They show how Lutyens is making the most of his opportunity. Oak crops up everywhere. It's a symbol of what Lutyens intended this house to be, a home and a refuge. The materials are all used in a way that I would describe as soft. This gentle merging of two surfaces shows Lutyen's care with every junction in the building. The weather vane illustrates the story of a long dead Dean of Sonning. He was fond of long and boring sermons, and so he always preached to an empty church. Through the archway we get a glimpse of the entrance court and from the arch itself Lutyens radiates bands of tiles, the lowest of which continues under the windows. The windows stretch under the eaves in bands. Their oak frame and mullions form a major rhythm interlaced by the leaded lights of the small paint. At the gable end, the bay projection is slotted under a massive projecting oak beam and the roof curves gently outwards where it forms the gutter. The pleasing nature of these forms is echoed in the details. Lutyens faithfully followed vernacular precedent and was meticulous in his handling of materials, which, in true vernacular fashion, he manages always to make both functional and decorative. Every point where beams meet is an opportunity for Lutyens to exploit the visual possibilities, and the irregular curved beams break down the surface into a whole series of different shapes. The garden front is deliberately impressive, with its projecting bay and recessed arched entrance. This is nicely linked to the chimney, which projects forward from the facade as far as the eaves. It finishes with the splendid modelling of the three stacks it supports. The bay window identifies the living room and, like the chimney, it's a dominant element on this façade. Once again, bands of windows under the eaves.
This is the garden side of the extension designed by Lutyen's assistants. It contained the nursery wing. Lutyen's didn't altogether approve of it, and it's certainly at variance with the rest of the design. Across this lawn, the water channel forms an axis parallel with the garden front. The main communication route emerges at this point, and the change of levels gives the effect of a bridge with a gentle arch, from which we can look down into a pool. The semicircular tiles of the balustrade manage to echo Lutyen's use of curves throughout the design. And here's another example. The circulation axis ends with a semicircular flight of steps, radiating outwards into the wild part of the garden. Here there are fruit trees, iris beds and romantic long grass. Finally, I would like to pose the second question which I asked at the beginning. How good was Lutyen's as an architect? I think Lutyen's ability transcends purely stylistic considerations and that he should be assessed in terms of his own objectives. The deanery has been called a perfect architectural sonnet and it's difficult to imagine a happier solution than this for Edward Hudson of Country Life. And of course, Lutyen's designed a whole range of great country houses that were illustrated in Hudson's magazine. Two themes underlie all his work. The interrelated concepts of the romantic and the classical and his gifts were the specifically architectural ones of being able to use materials with a complete understanding of their properties and of being able to assemble forms and spaces so that they play on our emotions in the gentlest way. He belonged to Edwardian England and his work represents the values of a society that believed passionately in this nation's heritage. If they and Lutyens were content with their world, can we really blame them? <laughs>